What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about rotator cuff tears. If you guys want to follow along with some awesome notes, some great illustrations, go down the description box below. We'll have a link to our website. Go check that out. Also, if you guys like this video, you benefit from it, it makes sense, and you have some fun in the process, please support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, but most importantly, subscribe. All right, let's start talking about rotator cuff tears. All right, so let's start talking about rotator cuff tears. Before we do that, we obviously have to understand what is the rotator cuff, right? We need to know what is it made up of. We're not going to go crazy into the shoulder anatomy. We'll have another separate video on that where we really understand all the intricacies. But for right now, I really want you guys to just focus on what are the muscles or the tendons or the specific bursa that are involved within the rotator cuff? That Because it's important, right? So first thing is we're going to take a look here at kind of the shoulder joint area from an anterior view. And there's really one specific muscle that I want you guys to remember. So here's our scapula, right? This is all our scapula here. And then here you're going to have like your coracoid process. That's your chromion process connecting to the clavicle. And then here's your humerus, the humeral head sitting into that glenoid cavity, right? Well, there's a muscle that sits here in this fossa. You know what this muscle is called? This muscle is called the subscapularis muscle. Now the subscapularis muscle, it sits in this subscapular fossa, that's its origin. And then the insertion for it, as it comes all the way over here and attaches onto this little bump on the humerus. You see that little bump right there? That's called the lesser tubercle, okay? So one of the muscles that's on the anterior side here that I really want you guys to know is called the subscapularis. The biggest thing that I want you guys to know about the subscapularis is its function with respect to how it plays a role within the rotator cuff. Since it kind of pulls, imagine that it's pulling on that insertion towards the origin. So it's going to kind of try to rotate the humerus internally. So we just call that internal rotation. Okay, so it's involved in internal rotation, but particularly around what joint? Well, obviously, it's at that shoulder joint. All right, so that's one of the muscles that are involved within the rotator cuff. What I want you guys to remember though is how does the muscle connect to the bone? It connects to the bone via the tendons, right? So tendons are what connects muscles to bone. So really when we're talking about this muscle, this part here which is connecting the muscle to the bone is the tendon. Sometimes in patients with rotator cuff tears, you have tears within the tendon that is connecting to that subscapularis muscle to the bone. So you may lose the ability to internally rotate. So super simple stuff, right? All right, posterior view, look at, um, at the scapula shoulder joint area. There's a couple more muscles. Right here, again, a chromion process. You have your coracoid process. This is going to be the humeral head sitting into that glenoid cavity. There's a little like divot or fossa here. And you see this fossa here, there's a muscle that kind of sits right in here. It's a cute little muscle. It's called the supraspinatus. Now the supraspinatus sits and originates in that kind of supraspinous fossa. And then its tendon kind of works right underneath this acromion process. And then attaches onto this big fat knob here on the humerus. What's that called? That's called the greater tubercle. So imagine, again, you're pulling from the insertion towards the origin. It's going to pull the humerus outwards or away from the body. We call that abduction. So what's this muscle here? This first one, we'll put a one there. That is called your supraspinatus. And again, the big function for this one is abduction. Now, when we talk about abduction, it's really only kind of a, a certain amount of degrees. It doesn't bring it up all the way. It's only like a first maybe 20, 30 degrees that it's helping to be able to pull up, okay? So again, abduction, at what point? At the shoulder joint. Again, all these movements you're obviously gonna know. But if we're really being particular, we should specify where that movement's occurring. All right, second one here, right underneath. So you have, we have this, again, this is a chromion process, but this right here, how it kind of originates from this part of the bone here. This point right here is called the spine of the scapula. So obviously above the spine is the supraspinous fossa. Just below the spine is the infraspinous fossa. And there's a muscle that sits right in that infraspinous fossa called the infraspinatus. And the infraspinatus originates off of that. And then it goes and inserts on that big old knobby there. What is that called? The greater tubercle. So this muscle that sits in the infraspinous fossa is called the infraspinatus. 
And again, remember, we're looking at this from the posterior view, okay? So if we had the infraspinatus pulling on the insertion, it's going to pull the humerus the opposite way of the subscapularis. It's going to try to externally rotate it. So it's going to play a role with external rotation. And again, it's obvious, but at that shoulder joint. It's just good to get into a habit of saying where that movements are, okay? All right, and then the last muscle here that's involved is it kind of sits, it originates down here towards the bottom of the scapula, kind of near the angle, like the inferior angle. And it comes up, and same thing, it also inserts near that greater tubercle. What is this muscle that kind of sits towards like the bottom part of the scapula and then inserts onto the greater tubercle? This muscle here is called the teres minor. And again, if it's kind of like just like where the infraspinatus is, it should pretty much do the same thing, right? So again, it's going to be pulling the humerus externally. So it's the same thing, external rotation at the shoulder joint. All right, so we've talked about all the muscles from an anterior and posterior view. There's four of them, right, that we've kind of covered. So you're like, oh, man, this is a little bit too much, Zach. How the heck do I remember all of the muscles, and how do I remember what they do? Well, I think what they do is actually the easier part, but remembering the names sometimes is annoying, right? So you have a mnemonic to remember the rotator cuff muscles. It's called SITS, okay? So it stands for supraspinatus. You have your infraspinatus. You have your teres minor. And then we can finish that puppy off with the subscapularis, baby. And just remember, again, with all of these muscles that we're talking about, remember, their muscle is originating from these different like, areas, like the supraspinous, infraspinous fossa, angle, subscapular fossa. And then what happens is the muscle ex extends to the bone via the tendon to attach to that area of the bone. If there's any point where there is a break or a tear within these tendons, then you can develop a rotator cuff tear. Okay? Now, the last thing that I want to talk about just quickly is it's easy to see these in an anterior posterior view. I want to quickly see what they would look like in a lateral view and just two more quick structures. All right, so let's take a look here at the shoulder joint from a lateral view. So imagine you're looking here from the side, right? And I'm, I just pulled the humerus out of the way. So you're staring into that cavity of the scapula. So this right here is the glenoid cavity. Here, I'll write in there, son of a gun. I'll write in there GC to indicate that this is the glenoid kind of cavity, and that's where the humeral head will sit in, form that, that glenohumeral joint. Okay. Now, surrounding that, I don't want you guys to get too bogged down, but right around that glenoid cavity, there's kind of like this like fibrocartilaginous kind of structure here. This like bluish color here, this baby bluish. This is your labrum. This is called the glenoid labrum. And then just around the labrum, and this is obviously called the capsule, right? So this is your capsule. Now, there's a couple other structures that we need to obviously understand. So here's the glenoid cavity just above that. If you guys can kind of imagine from these views, there was a bone that sits right up above it. What was that bone called? We're just going to put here that this bone is the acromion process. Okay? And then there was a bone that was just anterior to it, and it was kind of poking out like right here. That was called the coracoid process. Well, there's a ligament that actually has to connect between them. Just combine the names. The, uh, the coracoacromial ligament is going to be between these guys. Now, the next thing that I need you guys to know is there's a couple other things here. So we got the bony stuff, right? The glenoid cavity, we got the labrum, the capsule, we got the bones, the acromion process, the coracoid process, the ligament that connects them. Now, what are these purple structures? I don't really want you to get bogged down on them, but they're important for helping to maintain stability to the, to the actual shoulder joint and the capsule. But these are all the ligaments. And you know what's nice about these is they have a very simple name. <laughs> they're primarily in the anterior portion. So I, one of the things to get a good understanding of, as I should have told you here, from a lateral view, this is that nice view, but this side, let's actually kind of annotate this, this is the anterior point of this lateral view, and this is the posterior point of this lateral view. Okay, so 
if you guys were to imagine, these ligaments are primarily kind of like anterior and inferior, and they're called the glenohumeral ligaments. It's actually really simple, right? So you have the superior glenohumeral ligament, the middle glenohumeral ligament, and the inferior glenohumeral ligament. They're just helping to provide some stability. All right, what else do we have here that's kind of important? We have these like fluid filled like synovial like pockets really, okay? And they're important. I really want you to understand these because they're important with the pathology. These are called your bursa. So this is containing like, it's like a fluid filled like, like a kind of like a ball if you will. And it really is designed to allow for tendons to slide uh, between kind of like areas really nicely to reduce any friction. And so these little fluid filled kind of cavity areas are called bursa. And this one here, it's just underneath the acromion process, so we call it sub. So it's the subacromial bursa. This is a really important bursa because a lot of diseases become involved right here with inflammation of this. And there's a very special tendon and muscle that runs right underneath it that if it becomes inflamed, it can really jack up those tendons. This one here is kind of a lesser significant bursa, but you should still know it because if it gets inflamed, same kind of process can happen to the muscle that runs just here. But this one is called your subscapular bursa. Okay, just again, imagine them as like little like fluidy kind of like uh, synovial fluid kind of like balls that allow for less friction for tendons to move between spaces. Okay? All right, so now let's talk about the muscles that are kind of around this area. Well, again, if you think about your anterior and posterior view, where would they be? Okay, just running underneath the acromion process, just underneath this bursa, there's a muscle that sits right here. What's this one called? Supraspinatus, right? What's the one that sits right on an anterior on the subscapular fossa and then runs anteriorly connect to the lesser tubercle? This one right here is called the subscapularis muscle. Then you have the ones that'll sit on the back, ones that'll sit on the infraspinous fossa is called the infraspinatus. And then the ones that'll sit towards the bottom of the scapula is the teres minor. And there is a muscle that sits down here as well. It's like the long head of the triceps, but I don't want you to worry too much about that because these are the primary muscles that are involved in your rotator cuff. So it's a good understanding to have a really good kind of view of how these muscles look from the anterior view, the posterior view, the lateral view. And really the other thing that I really wanted you to take away from this is other associated structures that are nearby that can contribute to the pathology in this disease. That being the subacromial bursa, some of the actual subscapular bursa, and also just some of the other bony processes that are nearby, all right? Now that we got the basic anatomy done, let's talk about some of the causes and pathophys that lead to this disease. All right, so let's talk about the causes, the reasons why someone can develop a rotator cuff tear, right? So it's actually really simple if we break it down into like two different kind of pathophysiological mechanisms. So we know the muscles, we know the anatomy, right? Which is kind of a really important thing. Once you get that down, a lot of this stuff is gonna come together really easily. So imagine that we have this kind of diagram here. Again, if we were looking at this, this is really like a posterior view of that shoulder joint, right? So this is a posterior view. Now, there's a lot of bones, a lot of bursa, a lot of ligaments that are nearby in the shoulder joint, right? If by any reason there's any kind of bony prominence, like you know someone who gets like osteoarthritis or they get like bone spurs, different types of like osteophytic processes. If those things are kind of like, let's say that you have here, like let's say here's your acromion process and you get some type of like osteophyte or bone spur that's popping off of this bad boy that's gonna apply some extrinsic compression and shearing across that tendon. That extrinsic compression, the shearing of that tendon rubbing up against that bone spur over time is gonna maybe produce micro tears, lose its integrity, and then it's gonna pop and then you develop a rotator cuff tear. So what I want you to remember is any kind of extrinsic factors, think about bony prominences, ligaments, and things like that. So if there's any kind of osteoarthritis of that joint, it increases the risk of forming like these little bone spurs. And those little bad boy bone spurs may produce like rubbing, shearing forces, compression of that area. The other thing is that there's lots of ligaments nearby, right? So any kind of ligament that's actually kind of uh, jacked up or inflamed or anything like that, that could also provide some compression. So another thing that we could say is let's kind of a, 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 a comply the ligaments. We made them kind of that bluish color. We can add that one in there as well. 
any kind of like ligament injury as well that puts the shoulder in kind of any point of instability. So if there's any instability of the shoulder that puts stress on that kind of like rotator cuff that also over time can produce micro tears, inflammation, and it can tear over time. So any kind of ligament injury, any kind of bony prominence or like bone spurs, osteoarthritic changes. But the big one, that's why I wanted to look at it from the lateral view is sometimes if someone gets that, you know that bursa, we have this actually kind of a combined one here. You have like your subacromial and it extends into what's called the subdeltoid bursa. If this subacromial bursa becomes super, super inflamed, then you lose the ability to reduce the friction of that tendon running between the areas between like the bony prominences. And so again, there's that compressive factor from the inflamed bursa and the shearing forces on it. And so any kind of like subacromial bursitis is a huge risk factor. Okay, so I want you guys to definitely think about that. So compressive or extrinsic types of uh, mechanisms that I want you guys to think about is any bony change. Osteoarthritis is a good example, bony spurs that are coming off and compressing. Another really good example is any kind of subacromial bursitis or what was the other bursa that was in the anterior portion? The subscapular bursa, it's becoming inflamed. So any kind of subscapular, subacromial bursitis could cause this problems. And any ligament injury, what's the big like, joint though, like there's ligaments between this joint that really can become problematic and produce instability in the shoulder. What joint? The AC joint. So really kind of any AC joint abnormality puts the shoulder at a super point of instability and increases the risk of rotator cuff tears. Okay, so I think we got the extrinsic mechanisms down. That's not too hard, right? What about the intrinsic mechanisms? What about something that's actually wrong? What do we say a rotator cuff tear is? It's a tear really within the, the tendon that's connecting the muscle to the bone of the humerus. What if there's something that's not wrong with the actual compressive or extrinsic forces? It's just something wrong with the tendon itself. What could be reasons that the tendon would have some issues? That's a good question, Ninja Nerds. What if I'm just stretching the crap out of that tendon? Or not just that, I'm putting so much tensile overload on that tendon. So there's an increase, like let's say I'm stretching the living crap out of this tendon or I'm causing an increase in what's called tensile overload. And usually this is whenever there's extreme eccentric contractions, okay, of the muscles that are involved. And what type of activity? Overhead movements. So usually any kind of like overhead movements that's repetitive. What's a good athlete that's constantly doing this kind of motion? Any kind of like quarterback or any kind of uh, baseball player, right? So pitchers, football players, things of that nature that are sw swimmers, anything with that consistent repetitive overhead movement with the tensile overload from the eccentric contractions, okay? So really think about those types of athletes, okay? Now, that's one particular reason, tensile overload. But you know what else is another reason? As people get older, right, aging, so as you get older and aging, lots of things unfortunately happen. Not a good thing, right? You get micro tears within these tendons. It's just a natural part of aging, so you get the micro tears. On top of that, with aging, you get calcifications. So now I'm gonna have these calcifications of the tendon. And then on top of that, as you get older, usually the microvascularity of the tendon becomes even worse. So imagine the blood flow to this tendon is also reduced. Generally, it's reduced in general, but it's even worse in aging. So there is micro tears, calcifications, and microvascular kind of loss. And all of these things puts the patient at a high risk for any kind of like maybe trauma, any kind of repetitive overhead movement, anything like that could put them at high risk for developing a tendon tear, okay? So again, what I want you guys to remember with the aging process is this leads to micro tears, this leads to calcifications, and this also causes a change in their microvascular integrity goes down. And that causes this area of like a critical zone. So if you have like, let's say lots of micro tears in this area, let's kind of imagine this. You have a lot of micro tears in this area right here. The blood flow to this area is really diminished. 
and you have lots of calcifications from whatever reason, maybe trauma, maybe some simple movement, it's enough to cause a tear within that tendon. So these are very important things. So aging and high tensile overload from repetitive activities, especially overhead movements. What's the last one? This one is not a super big one, but it's something to think about. And patients who have anything like inflammatory, like kind of systemic diseases. So let's kind of write over here, anything like systemically, systemic diseases that really just predispose them to developing e quick, easy kind of, mo maybe a simple motion, a simple repetitive motion that involves any of that external rotation, internal rotation, any abduction, overhead movement, anything like that, enough because of disease in the tendon can cause it to tear. What are these diseases that I want you guys to think about? What if I have somebody who has a massive inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis where they have uh, antibodies that are attacking their tendons and shoulder joints. What's a condition? You know, rheumatoid arthritis would be one. What if I have a condition where they have a poor healing, where maybe they have these small tears, they have these like small tears, and normally your blood vessels, you don't have a ton of blood supply to the tendons, but it's enough to maybe allow for small repair. And patients with diabetes, they have microvascular problems, right? They have very, very bad microvasculature. So the blood flow is gonna be reduced due to their hyperglycemia, and they have a poor healing process. So another disease that could cause this problem would be diabetes. And then what if there's a disease that there's actually intrinsically something wrong with the collagen? You know collagen is like one of the biggest components of tendons. What if the collagen is all jacked up in this bad boy? So the collagen or some of the proteins like fibrillin are jacked up in this, this tendon and they're not present or they're mutated or they're just abnormal. This would be connective tissue diseases like Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, okay? Not super common, but something to think about. All right, we've covered the causes, the pathophys. Let's now start talking about how can we go about clinically diagnosing these patients. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we go about diagnosing rotator cuff tears. Now, it's obviously a clinical diagnosis. There's some things that you could do, particularly with very physical exam specific tests and maybe some imaging, and we'll talk about that. But some of the things that may cue you up to think, oh, it could be a rotator cuff tear, is their description of pain, right? So they obviously have shoulder pain, that's obvious, right? So if you're tearing some of those tendons nearby, they're definitely gonna have some type of shoulder pain. But sometimes what's some key things that you may pick up from the history to kind of cue into that is that the shoulder pain tends to be right near like the anterior deltoid. So it tends to be more anterior deltoid in location. And also the pain is usually worse at night. You want to know why? It's because if they're laying on the affected side, it's really causing a lot of pain in that area. So if like, for example, if I have like an anterior deltoid pain rotator cuff tear that's on that left side, and I go to lay on that left side when I'm moving around during sleep, the pain tends to be worse in that area. So any kind of like compression or any kind of involvement of laying or on that affected area is one of the big things to cue you off on that. So obviously shoulder pain is very, very obvious. So if someone comes into the office and they say, hey man, I've been having some anterior shoulder pain, it's worse at night when I'm sleeping, how would you go about trying to figure out is this a rotator cuff tear? Well, we take it step by step. We inspect the area. So whenever you're inspecting someone with a rotator cuff tear, some of the big things that'll cue off on your exam is look for any kind of signs of atrophy. You know there's uh, what's called the infraspinatus atrophy. So sometimes in certain types of tears, if you look on the actual posterior aspect of their scapula, you may see a complete difference in the muscle bulk on the area if there is any kind of tear like an infraspinatus atrophy. Next thing is obviously palpate. You want to palpate around. What are you aiming to palpate? Palpate near the actual humeral head, the greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, feeling for any pain there, palpating your coracoid process, the acromioclavicular joint, all of those things. Now, the next thing is where you're going to be moving into range of motion. So this is a big thing to remember. Obviously, there's a tear. So them being able to initiate a movement on their own, contracting muscles and involving those muscles, is going to be difficult. So their range of motion actively, meaning they are doing it on their own, you're not doing it for them, is significantly reduced. And the passive range of motion seems to be somewhat preserved. Okay, now we have inspected, we're looking for any kind of atrophy, we're palpating for any tenderness, we're checking the range of motion, we'll do it for them passively, seeing if they have any pain, and then we'll have them do it on their own, seeing if there's any pain or inability to perform those movements. Then we do special strength testing to go back. What are the muscles involved? We have the supraspinatus. What does it do? 
abduction, so you're testing for any weakness in abduction. Then you're testing the infraspinatus and the teres minor. What do they do? External rotation. So you're trying to see, are they having any difficulty in being able to externally rotate? Subscapularis, what does it do? Internally rotate. So are they having any difficulty being able to internally rotate? So once you've tested the strength, if there's any weakness in those, you may be able to pick out, is there an area where the tendon could be teared or torn in this case, okay? So we've gone, inspected, we palpated, we checked the range of motion, which is reduced and active, somewhat preserved in, passive, check for any weaknesses involving some of the rotator cuff muscles. Then we get into your special tests. Now there is so many special tests that you could do. From the literature, the best kind of approach which seems to really provide a decent sensitivity of maybe a full thickness rotator cuff tear is three specific tests that you should always try on these patients. The first one is, is you try what's called the painful arc test. If the painful arc test is positive, there could be some signs potentially of a subacromial impingement, like a subacromial bursitis, which I told you is a very, very common cause for someone having a rotator cuff tear. The next thing is they have a positive drop arm test. This is kind of particularly looking at the activity of the supraspinatus muscle. So the supraspinatus is obviously supposed to be involved in abduction. If you drop their arm and they're not able to perform that or it drops really quickly, there may be something wrong with the supraspinatus. Lastly, is they have any weakness in external rotation. And again, which muscles are involved in the external rotation? the infraspinatus and the teres minor. So if there any of these are positive, if all three are positive, it is a high sensitivity for them having a full thickness rotator cuff tear. If maybe two out of the three are positive, then you have to go maybe to, either way you're gonna have to do imaging, but your potential like predictive value of it is it may be a little bit lower. But all three of these tests being positive is a very strong sign of them having a rotator cuff tear. There's many other tests that we can do, but these are the big ones that I want you to know. We'll talk about those other tests when we do these on, on Q. What are the things that after we've done our special tests that we would do? We want to employ some imaging. So we could start off with an x-ray. The x-ray is really just good to rule out any kind of other pathologies. Is there any dislocations? Is there any AC joint separation? Is there any kind of fracture or any obvious osteoarthritic changes? Or here's the big thing, in someone who has a rotator cuff tear sometimes, the humeral head, remember, the rotator cuff is also important for just maintaining like the humeral head in that glenoid cavity. So if you have a weakness in that, that head is not going to be kind of held tightly into that glenoid socket there. And so it can actually superiorly migrate. And so sometimes what you may see is you see there's a space between the acromion process and the humeral head. If that space becomes obliterated, it becomes smaller. That means that there's superior migration of the humeral head and it could be a sign of instability in the rotator cuff secondary to a rotator cuff tear. So what I want you guys to remember is any loss of space between the acromion process and humeral head. We call that superior migration of the humeral head which can be sometimes seen in a rotator cuff tear. Now these other two exams, so I would start off with an x-ray. If I have these three tests positive, go with the x-ray you can, rule out some other issues, and then I like to use ultrasound. It's a dynamic test and it's really cool. So it can look at the dynamic movement of the actual uh, the tendon. If you get a good enough view and you're looking, having them abduct, you'll be able to see the tendon in its dynamic motion, seeing if there's any kind of weakness, if there is any tears. It's also good at picking up tears, okay, and or tears. Okay, the best test, the gold standard, if you will, is going to be your MRI. If they have a contraindication to MRI, they can get what's called a CT arthrogram. They inject some dye into the actual joint and get a CT scan, and that may also be kind of an extra test that you could do if they can't tolerate an MRI. But the MRI is the best because it can pick up any kind of tear, whether it be a minor partial tear to a full thickness tear. It's going to be the best sensitivity um, of any test.
Okay, so we've gone through how we're gonna suspect a diagnosis of a rotator cuff tear. Let's actually do a nice quick physical exam on someone that we think may have a rotator cuff tear, looking at the big, big test that I want you guys to know on a person that we suspect has a rotator cuff tear. We're gonna bring our boy Q in. All right, engineer, so let's go ahead and do a rotator cuff examination on Q. We're gonna go ahead and talk about this very, very specifically. So Q, what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna have you take your shirt off so we can expose the muscles and the skin. All right, so when we're doing a rotator cuff exam, obviously any kind of examination, you always do inspection, you palpate, um, and then from there, we're gonna go ahead and do some specific strength testing, and then after that, we'll do maybe some special tests. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna be doing is obviously just inspecting the, you know, the muscular area around Q's shoulder, looking for any signs of atrophy, looking for any asymmetry. Do I see one shoulder maybe shrugging up a little bit more? Do I see one sagging a little bit? Very simple things. Then I'm gonna go ahead and palpate, and I'm just palpating near the area of the shoulder do I, and asking if he has any pain when I palpate around these areas. And again, I'm just kind of feeling around the coracoid process, feeling near the acromion process, feeling near like the greater tubercle and lesser tubercle, and seeing if there was any pain upon that palpation. If there is, there may be some particular pathology going on there. All right, so we've inspected the shoulder, we've palpated around for any tenderness. Now let's go ahead and just check his range of motion. So Q, I'm gonna have you stand up. All right, so we'll check his range of motion. We're gonna do passive and active range of motion. We would be comparing this bilaterally, but we're just gonna focus on the right side for right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and test all the range of motion here. So particularly of those rotator cuff muscles. So obviously if I wanted to, I could do all of the motions if we wanted to. I could check here, I could check flexion at the shoulder joint. If I wanted to, I could also check abduction at the shoulder joint. This is specifically looking for that kind of supraspinatus involvement. And then if I wanted to, I could also, kind of, if I want to, I could bring them up here to isolate these and I could check external rotation or I could check internal rotation. Okay, and then what I'm noticing is when I'm doing that for him, does he have any pain? Is there any kind of restriction of movement? And then I can have him do that on his own. So I can go ahead and say, Q, can you go ahead and flex your arms in front of you? Good, and can you go ahead and abduct away from your body? Good, and then if I have you, can you do external rotation for me? Good, and then internal rotation for me? Good, was there any pain or any difficulty with that? No. Good. All right, so we've tested his passive range of motion, his active range of motion. Again, we'd be comparing these bilaterally to see if there's any abnormalities. Then we could test strength, okay? So let's say that we wanna focus specifically on the supraspinatus. So it's involved in abduction, but really within the first like maybe 20 to 30 degrees. So what I'll do is I'll just bring his arm up to about where the extreme of that motion would be. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and stabilize that shoulder and I'm gonna push down. I want him to resist me from pushing down. Okay, so good, Q, can you go ahead and resist me from pushing down? Good. Normal strength, he's jacked, right? So there's no, res there's no difficulty in him being able to resist that movement. So definitely some good strength there, five out of five strength in this supraspinatus muscle, okay? The other ones that I would test is I could test particularly maybe the subscapularis, right? So the subscapularis is involved in internal rotation. So if I wanted to, I could go ahead and bring him again to like the extreme of this motion here, and I'm gonna have him kind of pull inwards, okay? So I'm gonna have you go, I'm gonna go ahead and stabilize here. Can you go ahead and rotate your arm inward? Good normal strength there, I don't see any difficulty in being able to perform that movement, okay? Next one there is I would test external rotation. So this is hitting kind of that, uh, and again, if we did the internal rotation, we could do it here, or we could bring it up here if we wanted to as well. So if I wanted to, I can go ahead and have him kind of push down, good. Same thing, I'm testing that internal rotation. If I wanted external rotation, I could have him right here. And again, I'm gonna have him push outwards against me, good and I'm testing the external rotation, particularly of the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and again, I could come up here, and I could again have him push backwards, good, and again, I'm testing the external rotation there as well. All right, so normal strength, I don't see any kind of abnormalities there, and again, I would always be comparing bilaterally. The next thing that you would be doing here is you would go on and say, okay, let's do some special tests. Let's see if there's any particular abnormalities. So first thing you wanna look for, is there any signs of subacromial impinge? Remember, that's a high risk factor for someone with a rotator cuff injury. So there's a couple tests that we could do for that. The first thing that we could do is we could test what's called the painful arc test. And so what I'm looking for is I'm looking to see if he has any pain within about 45 to 60 degrees to about 120 degrees of that abduction up above. Okay, so can I have you do that painful arc test for me, Q? Sure. Good. Any pain during that movement? No, so there's no pain during that movement then the painful arc test is negative. There's no obvious signs of potentially subacromial impingement. All right, so the next test I could do is what's called the Hawkins impingement test. Again, it's looking for any subacromial impingement. So what I'm gonna have him do is I'm gonna have him bring his arm like this. I'm just gonna go ahead and stabilize right there. And what I'm gonna do is when I have him kind of flexed to about 90 degrees, 
elbow kind of flexed here at 90 degrees, I'm just going to go ahead and internally rotate. And what you'll be looking for is do I see any wincing? Do I see any obvious pain? Do you have any pain when I do this cue? No. no. So no obvious signs of kind of subacromial impingement there as well. The next test I could do is what's called the Nears test. And again, I'm going to have him kind of pronate his arm. And again, I'd be doing this bilaterally. And I'm going to passively bring the arm up for him. Okay. And do you have any pain with this cue? No. Good. Okay, so again, no kind of issues there. And the reason why we're doing that is sometimes whenever you're bringing the arm up and kind of get that greater tubercle stuck around that area where there could be like some subacromial bursitis. Okay, so no subacromial impingement signs, okay? The next thing I could do is I could test the supraspinatus, okay? So what I could do for that one is I could do the drop arm test. It's a very simple one. So obviously when you're having the arm out here, there's gonna be the supraspinatus involved in being able to keep the arm away from the body, abduction. So if I were to hold his arm up and I say, okay, Q, I'm gonna drop your arm, see if you can hold it up, I'm gonna let go. His ability to hold that arm up means that there is a negative type of drop arm test. If it was positive, it would fall, okay? The other thing I could do is I could do what's called the um, empty can test or what's called the uh, Job's test. And so what I'm gonna have him do is, I can, again, I can have him kind of put his arm like this. And what I'm gonna do is, again, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna push down and have him push against any kind of resistance there. And his ability to do that as well as no pain. No pain. All right, that could be, again, no sign of particularly any kind of supraspinatus tear there. All right, next thing we could do is we could do the subscapularis. So the subscapularis, there's two tests that we could do for that one. So what we can do first is I can have him kind of go ahead and push on his belly. And when he's pushing on his belly, as long as he's not bringing that elbow in, he's utilizing internal rotation to push against his belly. So I'm gonna go ahead and have you push against your belly. And again, I don't see that elbow rearing in anywhere, okay? Let's get a good view of this. So Q, I'm gonna have you look that way. Mm -hmm. And do that test again, squeeze down on that belly. Again, do you see his elbow staying pretty much in the same position? Good, positive there. Well, actually there's no abnormality within this test. All right, so good there. Next test that we can do is we can do what's called the lift off test. I believe it's also called the Gerber's test. So what you can do is you can, again, I'm gonna have him turn around all the way. And then what I'm gonna have him do is let's go ahead and put that right arm on the lower back. And just first thing, see if he has that normal range of motion to perform that activity. Can you push your arm off of your back there for me? Good. All right, now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come on the side. I wanna actually test, make sure that there is no true weakness here or any kind of problems here. So I'm just gonna kind of stabilize his elbow, okay? And I'm gonna put my hand on his hand and I'm gonna have him push off against. Good, okay? So there is, again, no abnormality there within that subscapularis. Okay, now we can look at this from another view. We're gonna have him look this way. And again, you can have him come bring that arm back on there. Good, and go ahead and let's just test that normally. Can you push the arm off the back? Good, and then what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna go ahead and have him push off against my resistance. Good, and that subscapularis is intact, okay? Generally, if there was also any kind of abnormality, they would also try to kind of extend their arm outwards like they're doing a tricep extension, and it might be a little cheat, so watch out for that as well, okay? All right, we hit the subscapularis, we hit the supraspinatus, okay? We're looking for any tears within those. So I like to start off, is there any signs of impingement? If there is, then go on to the next thing, which is looking for any signs of particular tears within those muscles. Infraspinatus and teres minor are next. So what we can do is we can do the hornblower's test. The hornblower's test is pretty good for the teres minor as well as for the infraspinatus. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna bring his arm up, flexion about 90 degrees, elbow extension about 90 degrees, scapular plane. And again, there's two different variations to this. What we're gonna have him do is I'm gonna have him push his arm against me, and I'm just kind of trying to test his external rotation, basically, okay? Let's do it from this view so you guys can see that as well. Bring that arm up, 90 degrees of flexion at the shoulder, 90 degrees of flexion at the elbow, and again, I'm just gonna have him push against my resistance, testing that external rotation. So if there was any significant pain or inability to be able to perform that movement, externally rotating against my resistance, so for example, if I was doing this and he started to give out, then that would be a potentially a sign of maybe some type of teres minor tear or infraspinatus tear. Now there is another variation to this. Uh, so if the other uh, uh, variation of the horn blower's test, what you could do is you could have Q come up like this, like he's actually gonna be blowing a horn. And if there was an abnormality in this, particularly an infraspinatus or teres minor tear, what would he do? He may start kind of actually utilizing the trap muscles to compensate and start shrugging up that shoulder. And so that could also be a sign potentially of an infraspinatus or teres minor tear. 
The last thing that I could do to test the inverse spinatus is I could do what's called the lag test. So it's a kind of similar as the hornblower's test. I'm gonna bring them up to 90 degrees of flexion uh, at the shoulder and at the elbow. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to pull his arm back into as much extension as I can, external rotation as I can. And I'm gonna let go and I want him to hold it in this position. So if he holds it there, then that means that the inverse spinatus is intact. But if I were to pull back and all of a sudden I let go and it flies forward, then you may have an inability to be able to maintain that type of position, so there could be a tear of the infraspinatus. Same thing, let's get a good look at it here. So again, 90 degrees of flexion at the shoulder, at the elbow, pull back into external rotation, let go. That's normal. If I pull, 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 let go, he flies forward. That could be a positive test for the infraspinatus tear. Okay? Now, all of these tests are great, but again, to really get a good, good idea of someone potentially having a high likelihood of a full thickness rotator cuff tear, there's three specific tests that I want you guys to remember. This should always be the gateway and then you can do all these other tests as well. First thing that you do is, we did the painful arc test. So if you were to do the painful arc test, go ahead and do that for me Q. It was positive at any point that 45, 60 degree, all the way up to 120 degree, that's a potential sign of impingement. Next thing, drop arm. If I had him up here, I let go, it flops down, that's a supraspinatus tear potentially. And last thing is if there was any weakness in any of the tests of, ex like for example, infraspinatus tests, I had him try to externally rotate, or any of those, that could be also a sign of a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Those three are positive, high likelihood. All right, that covers our examination. Let's get back to the whiteboard. All right, so let's talk about the treatment of a rotator cuff tear. Now, how do we go about treating this? Well, you got your conservative management, right? For someone maybe has like a chronic tear, maybe you're not gonna go in there and do anything really about it immediately. Um, so what kind of the things could we trial before we kind of go straight to the surgical option? Well, things that you obviously are going to try is to reduce any of the inflammation. If there is any kind of subacromial impingement, any inflammation from the rotator cuff tear itself, you give medications to reduce the inflammation. So what can medications kind of give? Well, let's say that there's a lot of inflammation. Obviously, you know, you guys know your kind of your, your pathophysiology stuff, right? Whenever there's lots of inflammation, there's lots of what's called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid gets broken down into what's called prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and these bad boys just rev up the inflammation. Right? Well, what kind of drugs can we give that can help to be able to particularly reduce the inflammatory process? Well, we can give drugs like NSAIDs. Why do NSAIDs work? I can start off with NSAIDs. I can do things like naproxen. I can do things like ibuprofen. And I can do the NSAIDs because it specifically works by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase enzymes. You know, cyclooxygenase is involved in being able to stimulate the conversion of arachidonic acid, which is from breakdown products of like different tissue parts from like inflammation, obviously from the rotator cuff tear. If I inhibit this enzyme, I reduce the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes, and I reduce the inflammation effectively. There's another thing that you can do. You can also give drugs. So this would be kind of your first thing that you would try, NSAIDs. The second thing that you would go to is you would actually inject steroids into there. You know there's a test, it's, a, it's kind of a diagnostic and therapeutic test. You can do what's called a subacromial lidocaine test actually. So you may be able to inject some subacromial lidocaine into the area. And if there's actually maybe some resolution of the pain, then, okay, there could be potentially maybe some tendinopathy in there as well. Uh, so we could do the subacromial lidocaine. Again, remember, this is more for like the tendinopathy. So if there is any kind of like tendinopathy or like bursitis related issues, it's really good for these kinds of things. It's not really gonna help the tear itself. It'll help with some of the inflammation surrounding that area. The third thing that we could do is we could do corticosteroids. So corticosteroids, you can actually inject into the joint because you can get kind of a local effect within that area. And so we can have what's called intra articular injections. All right, so we've tried NSAIDs. We've tried maybe some subacromial lidocaine. You can do it as a test, like a diagnostic and kind of a therapeutic test. If it's positive, they have some resolution of some of the pain or some minimization of the pain. It could be indicative of a tendinopathy. It's not gonna fix the issue, but it may help to say, oh, there's something going on with the bursa or the tendon in that area. And then you can try intraarticular corticosteroids to help to reduce a lot of that inflammation as well. 
Obviously, after you've done your NSAIDs, you've tried the subacromial lidocaine test, and you've had some intraarticular injections of corticosteroids, you may have them go and see your friendly PT. You guys know that on the Ninja team, we have our own PT, Robert Beach. And so if we have our man here that you gotta go and say, hey, Dr. Beach, can you help me? My rotator cuff's all jacked up. What can I do to get this thing better? Well, our good old Robbie will say, okay, buddy, what we gotta do is, is we have to first and strengthen your range of motion. So we're gonna work on strengthening some of that range of motion. Then the second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna really work to stabilize that shoulder joint. Remember I told you that sometimes if there's any kind of instability in the shoulder joint, that can be somewhat problematic and causing issues with the rotator cuff tears. So we'll work on shoulder stability. And then the last thing is we'll work on strengthening some of those muscles around the actual rotator cuff and rotator cuff itself. Okay, and so we'll work on strengthening muscles around the shoulder joint, okay? So that's kind of the whole approach. We're not gonna go through all the exercises and things that we can do in this area, but what I want you to know is conservative NSAIDs. You can try your corticosteroids intraarticularly and PT. If those things do not work, there's a failure of that conservative therapy. There is a traumatic tear or you have a person who's super, super active, they're an athlete, and they need a quick repair, that's, this is not the best option for them, then we'll push them to get a surgical type of treatment. What is that kind of treatments that we'll go with? All right, so what's an indication for a surgical intervention, right? So we have someone, they've tried the conservative measures and it failed. So that's obviously one thing. So we've conservative treatment fails. The second thing is if it's any kind of like traumatic, so sometimes if there's any kind of traumatic tears, that may also be an indication. A third one is if they're like a highly like uh, competitive athlete and these conservative measures aren't gonna be best for them or their job, their occupation requires like full range of motion, it requires a lot of activity and you know these conservative measures just aren't gonna provide that for them, we may go that route of being a little bit more aggressive. Okay, so if there is um, kind of a high mobility need and for example I like to you know put down like athletes so if you have a professional athlete they're not probably going to try the conservative therapy they might go straight to maybe a surgical option if they need it to gain regain that full mobility a lot quicker or certain occupations that are requiring you to again have that full mobility and also if you're younger someone who's a little bit younger is more likely to be someone that will kind of push to perform these surgeries for because if you're a little bit older, the healing process is gonna be a little bit more delayed. It's a lot tougher to be able to have that full on healing in that area. So failure of the conservative measures, any kind of traumatic tears, or there's like a high mobility need in persons who are athletes. They have an occupation that requires it. And also if they're younger, you can be a little bit more aggressive. Now, what are those options of surgical therapy? We can either open them up, find where the tendon is torn and then repair it. Obviously that's not, the, you don't wanna to go to a super invasive route. So the option is, the preferred option, is we do something called an arthroscopic approach, which is way more preferred. And why is this preferred? Well, you're sticking a camera, right? You're sticking a camera into the shoulder joint. You're looking, you're like, oh, there that son of a gun is. There's the tear. I'm gonna go ahead and fix that this way. So that's the options of treating someone with a rotator cuff tear. Ninjas, I hope this made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope you had some fun. Ninjas, love you, thank you. And as always, until next time.